Well, hey, welcome to One Hope. We are so glad that you chose to click on the link and participate in our service today. I believe it was no accident that you clicked on that link today. I believe God has a word prepared in advance for you today. So it's great that you chose to join us. My name's Sally. I'm one of the pastors here at One Hope and it's great to be with you. Hey, you're in for a treat today because Jono, Pastor Jono Broadbent is bringing the Word to us today. And we always know that with Jono, you're going to get some dry jokes that are kind of a little bit awkward and you're not sure is he joking or not, but it's always a treat. Jono is also going to lead us in a time of communion at the end of his message. So if you're at home and you're able to, why don't you jump up now, go grab yourself a drink of juice and a cracker and have that ready so that you can participate in communion with us. We're going to head into a time of worship. I don't know about you guys, but what an emotional roller coaster we have been on the last couple of weeks. Actually, the last couple of months. All right, let's just be honest, the last couple of years. It's been an emotional roller coaster, and I don't know about you, but it is doing my head in. But you know what? God is faithful, He is steadfast and dependable. And right now we're going to sing of His goodness. We're going to declare His goodness, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's going on around us. We're going to declare the goodness of God. So why don't you join with us as we worship our Father, our Saviour and our King. Thanks team for leading us.
it's so good to be reminded of that today, that you are good, Lord, that you are a good Father. And we just wanna praise you for that today, Lord God. In a time where a lot of us might be feeling overwhelmed, Lord, I thank you that nothing else matters but you, Lord. At a time where we're getting so many mixed messages, we can focus on you. We can have you at the centre, Lord, and that makes everything better. Lord, we just wanna praise you today. We wanna take this opportunity that we have to praise your good name, Lord God. Let's declare that today. Let's sing together. Jesus at the centre. Jesus at the centre of the
Let's pray. Jesus, would You be the centre of this church? Lord, as I was singing that song, I thought, man, how focused we can be about the gathering. How focused we can be about not gathering in person on a Sunday. Lord God, would we be a church that's not about the gathering? Would we be a church that is about You, Jesus? that is centred on You, Jesus, and nothing else. Lord, as we feel disappointment about not being able to be together in person, would You remind us it was never about that, God. It was always about You, Jesus. Would You be the centre of this church, Jesus. Amen. Well, if it is your first time worshipping with us today. A big special welcome to you. It's so great to have you. As I said before, my name is Sally. It's great to have you with us. If at any point you've got any questions, you can pop them in the chat. There's also what we call a connect card on our website. You can jump onto our website, click connect card, and that will connect you with us and we can be in touch with you during the week. So please, uh, please use that tool if you need to. If you are part of One Hope, if you call One Hope home and you've been coming here for a while and and this is your church family, then we've got some sad news to bring to you today, church, and that is that Di Cotton passed away earlier this week. Di has been a a much loved member of this church for many, many years, participating and serving in a variety of different ministries. She'd been suffering from cancer for a number of years and her battle came to an end uh, during this week. George, her husband and the family, we we wanna send our sympathy out towards you and let you know that we love you and that we're praying for you. We're gonna take a moment right now to pray for George and the family. We're also gonna use this as an opportunity to pray for others in our church family who are experiencing grief and loss at the moment. There's been quite a number of people in our church family that have lost loved ones in the last few weeks. So I invite you uh, to pray with me right now and let's bring our brothers and sisters uh, to God in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a good Father. Lord, we bring before You George and the family who are in the midst of their grief of losing die this week. Lord God, would You be their comfort and their peace and their source of strength this week and in the coming weeks and months as they come to terms with the loss of die and go through all the practical arrangements of funeral and, and all those sorts of things. God, we lift them to You. We pray that Your presence would be really tangible in their lives, that they would really know Your presence with them, journeying through this with them, God. And we pray this same thing for each and every person in our church family who has lost a loved one in the last few weeks. God, You are our source of comfort and strength. And we ask that You would be that for each of our, each of our loved family members. God, we pray that for each person that is experiencing grief, that they would cry out to You, that they would know that You are with them. Lord, that they would sense Your presence powerfully in this season of life with them. We bring them to You in the Name of Jesus. Amen. Well, church, we're also going to watch another great video from one of our mission partners, our supported missionaries, Neville and Elizabeth Clark, who work for an organisation called WEC. One Hope have been supporting them for over 20 years in their ministry. And we're going to watch a video now and they're going to tell you a little bit more about what they've been doing. They're also going to tell you some of the opportunities uh, that God has been providing them with through this COVID season. So it's an encouraging video. Uh, So let's watch that together, church. And then afterwards, Pastor Jono is going to come and bring the Word. Thanks, guys.
Hey Church, we're Neville and Elizabeth Clark and we work as volunteers full-time with an organisation called WEC International. We'd like to thank the church for giving us these couple of minutes to share with you, but also we'd like to thank One Hope for supporting us over more than 20 years in our journey with missions. So a theme that God has been sharing with WEC at the moment in the area Uh, particularly in our area of Oceania that covers Indonesia, East Timor, the Pacific Islands, New Zealand and Australia is this theme of catching the wave. That means seeing what God is doing in the world, getting on our boards and catching that wave and going in the direction that God wants us to do. So for the last hundred years, WEC has been involved in reaching the unreached. That means people who do not have access to the gospel. But now what we're seeing a new thing is those countries are coming up and wanting to catch that wave to reach the unreached. And they're people coming from Vietnam, China, Indonesia, different parts of Africa and many other countries that are wanting to catch this wave. Yeah, so as area directors of Oceania, you might be wondering, um, what have we been doing in the last couple of years, especially as Prior to this, we were travelling a lot. Um, And obviously, we haven't been travelling very much. Well, we're mostly on the internet um, in our home, but we are managing to contact our leaders and our members in a much much more often and through with joining in their prayer meetings, joining in their business meetings um, that we normally wouldn't be able to do because usually they meet face to face, but they're all locked down and meeting on the internet anyway, so we can join in. We've also been able to be involved in quite a bit of training of our leaders over these days, and that's been a great blessing. We've also seen God doing um, quite a few things uh, in these days. One thing is that in WEC Australia, we've always wanted to reach out to refugees and immigrants, especially those that are from unreached people groups who normally over in their own country don't have access to the gospel and they come here. Um, but we that's just accelerated in the last year and a half when we worked with another organisation um, and they handed over their projects to us in Sydney with quite a lot of staff and uh, volunteers working in those projects. And that's been a very exciting thing. We've set up our own organisation called WEC Hope. Um, the other, another exciting story is in East Timor, um, when they started the, with COVID and their lockdowns, um, some of the people, they were not allowed to go to the market unless they had face masks and you couldn't buy face masks. So a member of our team looked and saw and realised that she was good at sewing, a sewing machine. So she sewed around about 150 face masks in the end, allowing people to go to the shops, go to the market, sell their vegetables and keep getting their income. So this was a very big thing. And also for the flood relief, they were able to take part in that, which happens every year in East Timor. So throughout the last couple of years, we've walked alongside our leaders with a great deal of sorrow in many cases, as well as joys in seeing the Lord doing amazing things. If you want to find out more about the stories of what God's doing in our area and pray for the people groups in our area, Could you please write to the email address that's on the screen and we can send you our newsletter. Um, Also, we have a prayer app for Oceania, which has one prayer point a day. And if you write to us and let us know, we'll let you know how to get that. Thank you so much um, for this time to talk to you. And we're just really thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hi and welcome. I want to add my welcome to Sally's uh, intro earlier and a special welcome if you're joining us for the first time here at One Hope. So glad you can join in. If you're listening via podcast or uh, online, fantastic that you can be here as we continue our series, uh, Currents, Faith and Culture. I want to start off today. Actually, sorry, I should say, my name's Jono. I'm one of the pastors from Amorlap Campus here at One Hope, if we haven't met before. 
My question is, uh, how many items are there in a supermarket? If you're sitting with someone quick, to and fro, what's your, what's your best guess at how many items there are in a su supermarket? And uh, you probably feel like the correct answer is uh, all of them apart from the one thing that you're looking for. Uh, for me, that is couscous every time. Couscous, I don't know where to find it. Anyway, how's this? It'll be on your screen. In 1976, the average supermarket stocked 9,000 unique products. Today, that number has ballooned to over 40,000. Yet the average person gets 80 to 85% of their needs in only 150 different items in the supermarket. That means that we need to ignore 39,850 items every time we go to the supermarket. We experience a staggering volume of advertising, information, content and opportunity in our lives every day. And uh, the internet is amazing, isn't it? You can find whatever you want. I was talking with my wife, Ellie, this week about this topic and she said, the internet is fabulous. I, I don't even know I need something and then I see it and I realise I need it. If you ever feel like you can't keep up with things uh, in life or on the internet, there's probably a reason for that. Did you know that 30,000 hours of content is added to YouTube every hour? 30,000 hours every hour. So that's 720,000 hours each and every day. So that equates to the same number of hours that a person is alive from birth to age 80 is added every single day. Every single day, a lifetime of content is added. And so you might say, oh, there's so much nonsense. But even if, even if one one hundredth of one percent was worthy of viewing, that would be 72 hours. One one hundredth of a percent is 72 hours. So even in one day, you're already two, two days behind from the previous day. And in an effort to make sure that we don't miss out on anything, uh, the average person checks their phone anywhere, anywhere between 60 to 160 times per day, which in waking hours, that's anywhere between once every 15 minutes and once every six minutes. But of course, if you're in church, uh, Pastor Matt wants me to let you know, like, we know, like, we know that that number goes up considerably during church, okay? We can tell the difference between when you've got the Bible app open and when you've been sprung checking the footy scores. We know, okay? This all contributes to a, a huge flood of information, much of which it seems we're pretty happy to dive headfirst into. And of course, so much of the information available to us asks something of us. It asks us to make decisions, which emails should I respond to? Which tasks should go to the top of the to-do pile? Which of the 40,000 items in the supermarket do I pay attention to? It can all result in what we're probably familiar with now, something called decision fatigue. I was thinking about this and it made me kind of long for days past where my wife and I would have a conversation that went something like this, maybe you can identify with it, where we would we were trying to work out what we wanted for dinner and so we would turn to each other and say, oh, I don't know, what do you want? Uh, I'm, I, I don't know. And then that conversation would go on until we realised it was kind of 9pm and we both ended up eating two-minute noodles. Deciding between opportunities and decisions and tasks that have both positive and negative elements consumes our energy. I was interested to read that our brains are designed to only make a certain amount of decisions every day. And once we get past that figure, we struggle to make wise and sound decisions if we make them at all. And researchers have observed that, that we become so overwhelmed by choice that decision fatigue even distorts our sense of achievement. We make so many decisions that it distorts what we feel like we're accomplishing. For example, a person scrolls through a, uh, a streaming service looking for something to watch. They scroll through the thousands of options and then they finally decide on one and they, okay, go, I'm going to watch that. And inside, because the, of the distorted sense of achievement, they actually feel like they've achieved something significant. I've, I've, I've picked a movie, guys, like how good is that? That's an odd thing to experience, isn't it? Or to realise about ourselves. And of course, this often goes the opposite way as well, where we feel a lack of 
self-worth about the decisions or we make or about who we are. We sometimes feel like we don't make the grade compared to the accomplishments of others that we see just in their lives or maybe online. Last week I went to the optometrist and my eyes were so sore and I was getting headaches and I just wasn't sure what um, was going on. And, and I feel like a few of us might be the same, that when we go to the optometrist, what we're really hoping happens is the optometrist, we start doing the, the eye tests and we're reading and the, and the eye, optometrist's eyes just open widely and, the, and, and we hear those words like, you have better vision than we have ever seen before. And they bring in the other optometrist and they realise that you're not even reading the poster, you're reading the fine print on the back of the poster. And of course, that never happened. He simply said to me, your eyesight is fine. It's your screen time that's killing you. And that wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting that my vision was starting to be a little bit impaired or I couldn't see as well as what I, as well as what I used to. And he said, no, that's, that's not the case. It's just that your eyes are tired. They just need time to rejuvenate and replenish. And I thought, well, that's easy for you to say when your job isn't feeling like it's completely in front of a screen right now. But I took him at his word and as I was walking out of the optometrist, I just thought, if that's happening physically, as many of us would be sitting in, screen, in front of screens for long um, periods of time, what else might be in need of re-energising? What else is fatigued? And it was as I was walking across the car park, I just thought, oh, just like our eyes maybe, it feels like our hearts and our conscience needs time to re-energise. Because aren't face-to-face conversations hard enough? You know, most of the people that I know, I'd say they are great people. They want to make relationships work and they want to make the lives of other people as enjoyable and fulfilling as possible. But in any close relationship, whether that be a good friend, a trusted colleague at work, a family member, a husband, a wife, you've really got to work hard to make it work sometimes, don't you? To listen well and to respond in a productive way, to compromise and reach a shared outcome together. And that is only increasingly challenging across a screen, in work meetings, in text exchanges where words can easily be misconstrued or misinterpreted. And so we have to work all the more hard. And that's where I just went, I think maybe is it possible that our consciences, our hearts, that bit that God has put in us where we, we want to make the best of our relationships needs re-energising? If some of you are really old, uh, you might be able to remember uh, what is called a What Would Jesus Do band. I can remember the, from my teenage years, that's how old I am. And um, there was a young adult in our church the other day. We were talking and she said, well, they've come back in. So you know you're old enough when fashion comes back around. And some of you eagle-eyed people uh, right now would have realised that I'm actually rocking a What Would Jesus Band do right now? I'm looking down here. Okay, that's the money shot for social media right there, isn't it? Anyway, the idea, if you're not familiar with it, is that you would like have the band on. It was kind of like this kind of conscience thing where you'd look down and you go, oh, um, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? And with uh, sound theology, you would respond to that and go, oh, Jesus, Jesus probably wouldn't blame what he did on his younger brothers. But as anyone who with a name starting with J knows, that can also mean what would Jono do? And that had a very different answer. But of course, I love the idea. And this would like, these were all the rage and maybe we're going to start seeing them around because this young adult from our church, they are just so hip and happening. They are convinced they're bringing it back. The what would Jesus do band? And I th- what, when this band came to mind is when I was actually just thinking, you know, that, that challenge of trying to work, do relationships via a screen, do relationships well when we're not used to the, dist- the physical distance between us. And I thought about the times when I, when I go online and there's social media comments or posts or videos and, or opinions and 
And, and I think about how the, the, t- the number of times that I struggle and go, oh, I think I know what they're saying, but I'm not quite sure. Is that what they're trying to say there? And I'm trying to interpret it. And I think, oh, I should, should I say something? Should I comment back? Should I like it? Should I do whatever? And then I'm like, I'm not sure. That could be open to misinterpretation. I don't want to confuse things even more. They're talking about something kind of important. Like, what do I do here? And I come back to my, what would Jesus do band? And what would Jesus do? Like, Jesus would give me a bigger band. Like, this is hard work. I don't know what to do. Because even the the best heart gets drained. The best heart gets tired. And we experience with less tolerance and less understanding, perhaps, we say things in haste and we say things in hurtful ways. And maybe important things get left unsaid. And we're human when we recognise that we're not perfect in this regard that relationships that deserve good conversation and deep listening receive spasmodic and interrupted attention as we someone sits across from us and they can probably just see the glow of our phone screen as we get a notification. And just check that out. Sorry, I was paying attention to you. And with physical distance, if we allow it, about bad attitudes can ripen like fruit in a bowl in warm weather and we kind of, our attitudes start to stink internally. I've recognised about myself in, in poor moments, I can feel like all the people that need to address their issues and need to pay attention to themselves are, are out there, the ones that I'm observing and interacting with and I look back and I think all the time I've missed that God wants me to pay attention to what's happening in here. I'm not hugely familiar with the idea of algorithms and and what they do, but I was reading during the week about how algorithms and personally curated social media and news feeds have created a fragmented environment where no two of us experience the same reality, which raises the question, what and who can I trust? The Wall Street Journal recently published a video investigating how a popular social media platform with one of the most advanced algorithms is able to detect, detect, I need to learn how to talk, don't I? Is able to detect the deepest desires of its users. And the Wall Street Journal set up a number of fake accounts run by uh, artificial intelligence programmed to have certain interests. And you can read along with this and it says, in one example of an account that was, high, that was designed to be interested in sad and depressing content, it took only 36 minutes of watch time for it to recognise the interests of that account. And by observing actions taken by the fake account, every video watched and liked, it didn't take long for 93% of the content served to that account was related to depression or sadness. And it clearly highlights how a depressed user could be driven further into depression or trapped in that cycle of of negative thinking or sadness because the algorithm is more concerned with keeping that user interested than it is in alleviating those feelings. And algorithms aren't interested in helping us heal or making us better. Their role is to figure out exactly how we are broken. I'm not saying depression is broken, but the, the bits inside of us that... I don't know, maybe, maybe we're just drawn to thinking in a way that we would agree that isn't helpful, like we're broken in that way. And it, 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 doesn't want to, it doesn't want to heal that or solve that or speak into that. It just wants to keep us engaged with that. And in the midst of a flood of information and content, it appears and it seems as if our brokenness and the bits where we can even be better people is simply a commodity. And it aims to, you know, it asks something of us and it doesn't care for us, but it asks something for us and takes something from us in the process. And so just a quick summary here. So if you're relatively normal, you're most likely to experience these six six things. You're likely to experience a flood of information, decision fatigue. Maybe you experience a distorted view of your achievements You might have an exhausted conscience. You might have questions about what or who you can trust. 
And you might have experienced where you engage in, with information and whether that be online or in person, where you feel like you are treated as a commodity. Author Daniel Levitin said, Every day we're assaulted with facts, pseudo-facts, jibber-jabber and rumour, and rumor, all posing as information. Trying to figure out what you need to know and what you can ignore is exhausting. And at the same time, we are doing all the more of it. Does this ring true for you at all? I think it would ring true for so many of us. And if it doesn't ring true for you today, I would encourage you, hang around because someone you know, this would ring true for them. I wrote down a couple of weeks ago as I was thinking about this, I could be drawn into a life fed by convenient, accessible half-truths. I can, I can fall into the trap of living a life fed by convenient, accessible half-truths. And as I wrote that down, I was reading through the book of Romans and it just happened a, a couple of minutes later where we read these words in Romans 1 verse 25 and it says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. I guess you can see my starting point where I felt that moment of conviction where I read that. Have I exchanged the truth about God for a half truth or a lie? Now the society that those words were written to are really different to ours, but I feel like they could be remarkably similar. And this passage isn't trying to commentate on the volume of information, technology, the opportunities, the algorithms that affect us. It it, it wants to first address and comment on our willingness to settle for half-truths in our life. So I want to ask the question today. From a Christian perspective, as followers of Jesus, or maybe you've tuned in today and you're yet to make that decision to put your life in God's hands, what other options is there other than settling for a half-truth or a lie. John, one of Jesus' followers, most passionate followers, said this in John 14, 6, and he said, talking about Jesus, Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is making a bold declaration into the middle of a society that had different beliefs about how you can find wholeness, how you find fulfilment and what the purpose of life is. Jesus was making a huge statement about actually what do we do with those things where we, you may call it sin, you may call it dysfunction, whatever it is, even where those moments where we don't live according to the own rules that we've put in place for our own life. And Jesus says, I am, I'm the only way that you can be made right with a loving God. And this is not only a truth, but in me you will find uncorruptible truth. You don't have to settle for living with a half lie or a half truth. John also recorded Jesus saying about this idea of truth, Jesus said, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In our remaining time, I'd just like to touch briefly on a few points that like, what is this truth that God wants to bring to our mentally hyperactive, entertainment addicted, possibly fragmented lives? The truth that Jesus brings is that in the midst of a flood of information, God wants to speak truth and truth that will bring life into you. So many of us would be able to, I guess, testify to the fact that God wants to speak to us intimately, that God knows us, that when we listen, God is wanting to speak to us and his words are words of life. If digesting and consuming information sharpens our opinions and what we think about what others say or what others believe or their opinion on this and that, how wonderful is it that stillness with God refreshes our souls? And that is freeing. Georgia talked about that a couple of weeks ago, how freeing it is that we don't have to try and take control of our lives. We can put it in God's hands. And that's the freedom that Jesus is talking about. Not that we can do whatever we want, 
but something greater and someone better at leading our lives is in charge and it's no longer us. In a world overcome by decision fatigue, it's good news and the truth is you don't have to second guess your identity and your worth. Anyone who puts their lives in the hands of God, the Bible says, is a new creation, a completely new identity. No more do we have to try and compare ourselves to other people, what they may or may not do, the way they present themselves, the way that we, I don't know, may feel feel a sense of lack or that we're not good enough. We don't have to live by that comparison. We're simply called to follow Jesus, that he will set us free, that he will, by the power of his spirit living in us, create us into the people that he desires us to be. When we struggle with a distorted view of our achievements, the good news is that our worth is not determined by the spectacle of online content that surrounds us. The Bible says that we were purchased with a price. As we read through the Bible together, I love it how we're surrounded by people in our church who are willing and their desire is to not make a spectacle of themselves. When I say spectacle, I mean they're not looking to lift themselves up and make them the centre of attention. And in doing so, they're following Jesus passionately because that's not what Jesus was about. Maybe today you feel like you've, if you reflect on your life, you reflect on the relationships you have with other people, that you feel that constant pull to elevate yourself to make yourself shine, to to make yourself a spectacle. If that's you, you may choose to do that, but God doesn't ask that of you. He doesn't require that of you. He doesn't require anything of you. He just asks that you step into a relationship with him. If today you recognise uh, you're carrying the fruit of an exhausted conscience, like I described, you've been working really hard at relationships and maybe sometimes you haven't been at your best. If that's you, the good news is there's enough of God's grace for all of your shortcomings. Towards the end of our service today, we're going to share in communion together and there is no better time to repent for the times you have been less than all God has created or desired you to be. To say sorry to ask that by his spirit, God would continue to create you into that person that he desires you to be. Maybe God would even challenge you to to go back if there's people that you've hurt. Maybe God would challenge you to reflect on conversations and just go back and make those things right. And in doing so, you glorify and honour the God that lives within you. Some of you today are desperate to hear a voice that you can trust. A voice that you can, that uh, you can, that doesn't change, that you can count on. As I said that out loud, I'm like, oh, that's a political line. Oh, desperate to hear a voice you can trust, but it's true, isn't it? A voice that doesn't change, and a voice that comes from deep, deep character. A voice that has your best interests at heart. A voice that would remind you that the grace of God was poured out in the person of Jesus Christ. So our souls no longer need to be pushed around by half-truths and lies. That in in the midst of a storm that says you've got to be this, you've got to do that, you've got to be this type of person to be accepted, that there's a voice that says you don't need to be any of those things. Without shame today, you can ask God and say, God, would you show me what is true about me? Would you show me what is true about the other people in my life? God, would you show me what is truly of worth? God, would you show me what is truly of value within people? That you would see yourself and you would see other people through God's eyes, not your own. And he is trustworthy. And while our world views brokenness as a commodity, that God will never use your brokenness against you. 
where social media and the internet says you, you should hide that away. You've got to be perfect. You, get, like, you only present parts of who you are. Jesus takes our brokenness and he takes our shame upon himself. This is great news. This is the truth. That your brokenness, your feelings, that you, there's part of you that need to be restored and changed that is never a commodity to God. And, and if that is you, you, that can feel so vulnerable to bring that out in the light before God. Like, you know, something that we've tried to keep, keep hidden and, and, and pushed away, that can feel really vulnerable to do that. But I just want to share with you this. Honesty and knowing the truth of who God is, is way better than any lie, way better than any half-truth that promises to fulfil us. And I know there's a bunch of you today that are, that are joining in church so that you've, you've experienced this, the truth of who Jesus is. Like you know Him as the way, the truth and the life. You've experienced that the truth of who Jesus is brings, brings freedom and brings joy. But I also want to acknowledge that that you might be here today and you've never made that decision. You've never decided to put your your life in God's hands. You've never been as intentional to say, actually, I want to to put half truths and lies behind me and I want to choose to live for something else. The way that you can begin that journey today is you can say yes to God. And it will require a radical step from you but a radical step you can take right now. And if you know you want to make that decision, I'm just going to pray a really simple prayer. We don't even need to close our eyes. I don't know what your expectations of like, you know, religion or spirituality is. We can just say these words, but if you believe them in your heart, God wants to do something incredible for you and in you. And if you're a one hoper or you're, you've given your life to Jesus some time ago, you can, you can say these words afresh in your heart and you can celebrate that Jesus has been faithful over maybe, maybe years, maybe decades. He's been the way, the truth and the life in, in your life. If you want to make that decision for the first time today or you want to celebrate these words, let's, let's say these words together. My God and my heavenly Father, thank you for what you did in Jesus Christ to save me. Forgive me for all I have done wrong. I commit myself to you and to your purpose. Fill my heart with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you from now on. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, if you've made that decision, that is the most incredible amazing decision you can ever make. And we would love to support you in that decision. Pastor Sally's going to wrap up at the end and she'll just have some pointers about how we can do that and love to, I don't know, meet you in person, connect the dots and we can continue a great journey together. As I said, to finish up a service, we're going to share in communion together and we're going to take some juice and some biscuit, symbols of Jesus' body and blood given for us. And if you don't have those things where you are right now, maybe you just want to take a moment to be still and reflect. Of course, if you can pause this and and organise those things and come back, of course, then please do that. And in sharing communion together, we're, we're, we're saying and we acknowledge that we are the recipients of Jesus' sacrifice and that today we recommit our lives to God. And I'm going to pray. And, and after that, as uh, Boaz leads us, we're going to sing together. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. And you can take communion in your own time. And even though we're dispersed and we still have the same heart, we're honouring Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. So can I pray before we sing and share communion? God, we acknowledge today that we, we've all been swept away by a flood of information. We've given more energy and more of us to social interactions than we have to you at times, Lord God. God, where we are guilty of allowing our media-saturated lives to erode our time and, and commitment to you rather than enrich it. We want to say sorry for that. And there's times where our desire for, for content, for entertainment and They've distracted, those things have distracted us from our God-given duties. And for those things, we receive your forgiveness and grace. 
And as we share in communion, we rededicate our lives to You. Where we have settled for a lie, by Your grace, please pour in Your truth. And may that truth set us free, free to serve and love You. In Jesus' Name we say thanks. Amen. Just lift the name of Jesus. Just give Him the praise. Give Him the praise for all that He's done. For the things that He's done in your life, in your family, in our church, in our land. Give praise to the Lord God.
message from Pastor Jono today. I don't know about you, but what a challenge. I, I know that I allow media to rob me of the time that I could be spending with my Saviour. What a great message. I know you've been challenged as I have. Hey, if you are one of those people that Pastor Jono talked about, if you're one of those people that prayed that prayer for the very first time, we would absolutely love to connect with you and resource you and support you. Uh, You can let us know via that Connect card that I referred to earlier. Just head to our website, onehope.org.au. Click on the word connect at the top of the screen and there will be a form that you can fill in and uh, we would absolutely love to give you a call during the week uh, to pray for you uh, and and support you in any way that we can. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. You know, as I sat listening to Pastor Jono, I thought this service is so great. This this message is so great. I need to share it with some people. Uh, Why don't you ask God right now, who is somebody uh, that you could share this message with? Literally share it on social media. Maybe send it to someone in a message or in your news feed. I think there are thousands, millions of people out there that need to hear the hope that they have in Jesus and um, the truth that He can offer us in this world that's full of lies and half-truths. So thanks so much for being with us, church. We love you. We miss you. Keep pressing into His Word. When you're scrolling through that news feed, why not ask yourself this question? What am I searching for? What am I looking for? Ask yourself that question and make a decision. Do I continue with the thumb? Or do I decide to spend my time somewhere else? Have a wonderful week. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.